By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have some more magic for you from the Forest Frenzy, the Urborg Forest Frenzy, the old school magic tournament that was held in Dusseldorf, Germany. So every Tuesday I bring you an update from this tournament, a new match video, and we have reached the semi-finals. We saw the quarterfinals last week. We're moving on to the semi-finals, and there we see two top decks battling it out. One of them extremely beautiful, and that is the Reanimator deck, because we have Edo who plays Reanimator, and he's gonna take on Nick, who is playing with the classical The Deck. So that is Uber Control. So it's gonna be really interesting to see both of these decks battle it out. It's also going to be interesting to see the deck back on the channel. It's been actually quite a while since I featured uh, the deck last here on Timmy Talk. So it's it's kind of interesting to see it again here in the semifinals. And uh, before I actually go to the deck deck section, I would just like to point out that as always, uh, if you want to go directly to the games or if you want to see any specific deck deck of one of these two players, simply use the timestamps that are listed in the description below. So you can go to the description below, there you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. And if you click on there, that will take you straight to the games, to the action. I know some of you want to watch the game before and then go to the deck deck or just skip the deck deck altogether. So all that is possible. And also the description is a great place to find out more about this tournament, the specific rule sets and all that stuff. Okay, so that is enough information from me for now for the introduction. So I guess we can start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of Edo. Let's take a look at his reanimator deck. And here we see the reanimator deck of Edo and what a beauty it is. And maybe you recognize this deck because two weeks ago I've showed a match with this deck from the Swiss rounds. Unfortunately, I could only show you one game because there were some technical issues, but I guarantee you this time I have a full match of this beauty right here in the semi-final. So how cool is it to see a deck like this, a reanimator deck in an old school tournament getting to the top four? I just think that's absolutely great and it shows how good this deck must be working. So I'm just gonna like quickly explain what the deck does. You probably know it already, but I'm, you know, I'm just going through the motion. Um, the, the main, one of the main cards in this deck is Bazaar of Baghdad, right? A full play set of this card. It's a uh, beautiful art, stunning card from Arabian Nights. You tap it to draw two cards and then you have to discard three cards. Now what you want to do with Reanimator, right? You want to fill your graveyard as fast as you can with big, beefy creatures. So we see the four legendary creatures there in the middle, absolutely stunning with that Nicol Bolas, Sulkanar the Swamp King, Johan and Bartol Runax. Those are just some kick-ass creatures. And then we also see three Sarah Angels there on the right top. So you kind of want to get those creatures in your graveyard as fast as you can. And then you want to get them back using, for example, an Animate Dead, but you can also use All Hallows Eve. So All Hallows Eve is a card from Legends. It's a sorcery. And when you cast it, it actually does nothing because it comes into play with two Scream Counters on it. And during your upkeep, you remove a Scream Counter from All Hallows Eve. When both screen counters are removed, that's when the real magic happens. All the creatures from all graveyards come back into the game. So that means also the creatures from your opponent. Now, obviously, the idea is that you have a lot of big beefy creatures in your graveyard because your deck is built around that theme and your opponent probably doesn't or maybe only has one where you have a really big one. And so it's into your advantage, right, to have that. Now, Obviously, um, he's also playing with Swords to Plowshares in this deck, playing with White. But in this in this case, that works extra good, of course, with All Hallows Eve, because Swords to Plowshares removes a creature from the game. It's exiled, right? So All Hallows Eve doesn't work on that. And that's also kind of a problem at the same time for when you play with an All Hallows Eve strategy is, of course, that there are so many swords in the meta. It's simply probably the best creature removal in old school. So there will always be a lot of creatures that are unfortunately removed from the game. So they can kind of work against Edo here. But anyway, what he wants to do is pretty clear, but he has another plan up his sleeve as well. He's got what we call a transformational sideboard. And that means that your sideboard plan is completely different than your main board plan, right? And if we look at the sideboard plan, we see he has Black Vice, um, he has the, uh, the, the stasis plan with the time vaults. So basically what he wants to do is he wants to probably take a lot of his creatures out. Maybe he even wants to play creatureless, and then he wants to get his vices in, his time vault in, his stasis in, and he kind of rebuilds his deck into his stasis time vault lock 
prison deck, you know, which is completely different. The cool thing is that like when you're the opponent, you're like, okay, um, he's playing reanimator. So I need to have a lot of swords of plowsiers, for example, in my deck, you know, because I want to remove his big creatures. Um, you know, I, I, I need, so you go sideboard with a specific plan in your mind, but then what Edo does, he's probably going to just put his whole transformational sideboard in after game one. And all of a sudden you're playing against a completely different deck. So all your creature removal, for example, will then be dead cards in the deck of your opponent. So that is pretty cool. So I'm really looking forward to kind of see Edo using his transformational sideboard and to kind of see how that is going to work. So, um, you know, Edo, thank you for bringing this deck to the table. I'm really excited to see it in action in the semifinals. Before we go to the actual match, let's first take a look at the deck of his opponent, the deck played by Nick. And here we see the deck of Nick, simply called The Deck. And of course, this is known as the ultimate control deck. And when you look at this list, you understand why. There are so many answers. I mean, obviously he's got the four counter spells and the mana drain. He's also got Swords to Plows here. He's got Disenchants and Define Offerings. So basically what the deck wants to do is just do a lot of one-for-one -one trading. What I mean by one-for-one -one trading is your opponent casts a big threat you play a sword, you know, he casts an artifact, you play divine offering. He he plays a spell, you play a counter spell. So you're basically trading a counter spell for one of his cards. You're trading a sword for one of his cards. And slowly in the game, you're gonna take advantage. Maybe by putting an abyss there, you're gonna take away two of his creatures or, or even more. And then you get this little advantage and slowly you're creeping up. You're getting more and more and more and more advantage. And he also has four jam day tomes for that reason. So you really want to get that card advantage and you want to be so extremely patient. That's why it can be kind of boring playing against the deck, you know, because the opponent is just sitting back and waiting for you to do things. If you're not doing anything, a, the deck player is very unlikely to do something. Just, just try that for once. When you play against the deck and you think, okay, I'm going to lose anyway, just sit back and don't do anything. Just see if your opponent is see if you can force him to kind of start actually playing magic anyway so you sit back you wait for him to do something um and you, maybe you're thinking what are the win cons in his deck well actually when you play control really really well you don't need that many so he's playing with four mistress factories so those are ways he can kill his opponent he's playing with a disintegrate so that could be a way to kill his opponent another way can even be decking you know, by playing a huge brain geyser. If you're like later in the game, that can be a way to win as well. And also in the sideboard, we see three Sarah Angels. So depending on what type of deck he plays, he can decide to go a little bit more on the aggressive side by boarding in those Sarah Angels. And I mean, just the fact that he's playing with four Jam Day Tomes already shows that he's just going for uber control. Also that single Ivory Tower in there can really shift the game as well. The nice thing is when... Um, you're playing this uh, when you're playing Demonic Tutor, which is also in this deck, all your silver bullets, you can time them by two, right? So all the cards that can shift the game for you, where you probably only have one of them in your deck, with Demonic Tutor, you can always look one up. For example, when your opponent is close to death, you can look up that Disintegrate to, to change the match. Uh, when you are really dire in problem and you need lives quickly, you can, you can look up that one Ivory Tower. If you're, if you're down on cards, you can look up that Ancestral Recall or Brain Geyser. You know, so that one Demonic Tutor just gives you a lot of options for all your one-off uh, cards that can have a huge impact on the game. Now, there's one more thing I'd like to say, and then I think we can move on to the actual match, because I'm really looking forward to this match. And that is that don't underestimate playing with the deck. People that have played with it know that it's not easy. And I want to say, Nick, man, the fact that you made it all the way to the semifinals after this like full day of playing, I was there too. I was after my matches, I was done, man. And uh, I, you know, I play mono blue, uh, but this is even harder control what you're doing. So from that perspective, you know, I have to say, I tip my hat to you for reaching into the semifinals, um, you know, cause it's not like, oh, I'm going to play the decks. So I'll probably win the tournament. No, that's absolutely not the case. You need to really be a good player um but yeah like i said as well the the dark side of this deck is that it is very reactive meaning uh, you're not really doing a lot unless your opponent is doing a lot and that's always something that you know i i enjoy casting creatures and stuff but that just depends on what kind of magic you enjoy playing anyway this is the deck man um and we're going to see it in action right now here let's go to the semi-finals of the urborg Forest Frenzy 2021.
Game number one, here we go. So it's the reanimator player sitting on the left, the deck player Nick sitting on the right. It looks like he's just taken a mulligan, the player that is on the deck. So that means he's going to start with six cards. And look at that, Edo also deciding to take a mulligan with his reanimator deck. So he's going to shuffle up. Not sure yet who's on the play, by the way. We'll just have to see. So he's going to get a fresh seven and then he'll have to put one on the bottom if he decides to keep. So he's looking there and we kind of see, I see a fatty in there, I see a mana drain. Okay, he's deciding to take another mulligan. Okay, that means he's going to go down to five cards. So that is pretty heavy. Of course, I mean, he is playing with power and, and some seven draws. So if he could like... He's got to do two cards away. Hopefully he can find like Wheel of Fortune, Ancestral Recall. I don't believe I see those cards in his hand, by the way. Look at that. He's putting three on the bottom. So this was already his third um, his third mulligan. Only four cards left. Oh, that's not looking great. Is that a demonic, by the way? Look at that opener by uh, Nick here getting an extra turn with the time walk. If that is a demonic, you could, of course, go for, yeah, demonic tutor. So I would... Go for Wheel of Fortune, he's got the City of Brass. He could do that, or he could go, of course, for an Ancestral Recall. Interesting. The problem, of course, with that Wheel of Fortune is he would give Nick also seven new cards, and, and Nick has already pretty much emptied out his hand with those two Moxen. He has to pass a turn here regardless. And uh, Nick drawing, taking on uh, turn number three already because of that time walk that he played earlier. And he's just passing turn. Cannot find another land, it seems. And this is also tricky. He knows he's playing against an opponent that has counter magic. What can he do? So he's playing Chaos Orb first. I think that's a good decision. Because what he could do... Ooh, Counterspell. Okay, at least he lures out one of the Counterspells. Unfortunately, he doesn't have enough mana to play out anything else. I wonder what he's looked up. There we see a Black Lotus and a Jam Day Tome. Okay, so he's looked up the Time Twister. Now he's casting the Time Twister. He could, of course, use his Black Lotus to counter. He's not doing that. I'm happy, Nick, <laughs> that you're not doing that. I was a little bit afraid, you know, and this is one of the reasons why Black Lotus and Counter Magic are so good, right? I mean, Nick's got to tap out to cast a Jam Dayton, but because he's got the Black Lotus, you know, he plays out the Lotus afterwards and he still has that counter capability open. So, uh, but it was really a good job here from Edo deciding to play Chaos Orb first, trying to lure out that counter. And uh, seven fresh cards for both players. And also the graveyards are empty again. And we see a pass turn here from Edo. And there we see Mox Ruby, Mox Pearl. So almost all the jewelry on the table here and a volcanic island. And look at that. What is he going to cast here? Is it just going to be a huge fireball or something? Or disintegrate or something? Or, of course, a Brain Geyser could be. Looks like he's changing his mind. Taking one, playing a Demonic Tutor. Ooh, that's quick. I wonder what he looked up. I mean, it could be an Ancestral Recall, of course, but you don't know what's in his hand. Maybe he just wants to look up a Counter Spell so that he knows that he's got that open. Or even worse, a Mind Twist. But I think if it would have been a Mind Twist, he would have twisted straight away. Mind Twist would have been quite good, actually, with the Black Lotus. There we see Sarah Angel. I'm expecting exactly a counter spell here. There's the untap. There's another City of Brass. And when you're the deck player, you just have to be patient. So I'm expecting, yeah, my twist here. That's probably what he wanted to do earlier in the game. Ah, oh, man. This is so yucky. This is so dirty. Nick, this is dirty. Anyway, the only good thing, the silver lining here for Edo, is that at least he's got some big creatures in the bin. So if, he, if he's able to resolve an All Hallows Eve, and that's exactly the hard part here, if he's able to, because you see that Nick is already starting the card advantage train with his Jam Day Tome, and that means the more cards he has, the more advantage he'll have, the more answers. Talking about answers, here we see the counter spell on the Wheel of Fortune, and this is what the deck player wants to do, just have complete control and slowly win the game. That is, that is what the deck does. And the trick, of course, is knowing what to counter and when to counter, which is absolutely not easy. Here we see a Chaos Orb and an activation in, in response. Again, that answer from Nick. The deck will always have answers. So Chaos Orb is gone. And, and when you play the deck, you just have to accept that, that you'll run into a lot of answers. 
and you got to try to kind of play through it, but that's going to be really difficult with that Jam Day Tome that's active on the side of Nick. There we see two more damage for Edo, going to drop to 14 here, and I mean, things are looking bad. Another Jam Day Tome. Perhaps I wouldn't have played it and chosen to just draw an extra card instead. Then again, he still's got four open on his end step. Here we see an All Hallows Eve. Are we going to see a Counterspell? He's already played a couple of Counterspells, although with the Time Twister, everything got back into the deck, shuffled back in. So I guess only one Counterspell in the bin, I believe. And it's actually going to resolve. Wow, that is pretty sweet because edo has got some big creatures in the graveyard. It would be absolutely fantastic if we can see the All Hallows Eve resolve here. Edo's on 12. I really hope this is going to work. I've, I've got my fingers crossed here. Go Edo. Go Edo. You can do it. And of course we see Nick grabbing more and more cards from his Jam Day Tomes. I do think it's really cool that he's just decided to go with a full playset of those. Really going for that card advantage. Attacking here for two. Going to put him on 10. Oh, he's actually going to animate. There we see a lightning bolt in response. And he's going to go to 10. It was, it was worth a try. At least he's taken a lightning bolt out of the hand. And oh, look at that. Bartle Runax. That is such a cool creature. And we've got two Sarah Angels coming in. Oh, man. I am expecting Nick here just to have a lot of answers. Maybe he even has an abyss in hand. I don't know. But uh, it is pretty cool. It is really nice to see this on the battlefield. And what is he going to do here? Playing a Swords. Playing another Swords. So two Swords to Plowshares. So both of the Angels are already gone. What is he going to do with Bartol? Does he have another solution? Oh, he's got to Disintegrate for Bartol. And this is exactly what you kind of expect. The deck has so many answers. Still, it was really cool to see All Hallows Eve resolve. And unfortunately here for Edo, by the way, oh, he's playing Johan. I love seeing these creatures, man. This is really cool. Uh, but what I wanted to say, the unfortunate thing here for Edo is that all these creatures are also removed from the game, you know, the two uh, swords and also the Disintegrate. So all those three creatures are out of the graveyard. So even another All Hallows Eve is not going to help. There we see an Abyss. This is not great. And there we see a Brain Geyser. So here you just see that complete control. Like the deck player just constantly has these answers. Constantly has card advantage. Here, taking a extra turn with a Time Walk. And I mean, that is just frustrating if you're Edo right now. But it's a really good demonstration of how strong the deck really is. And here we see a Chaos Orb being cast and a Pass Turn. And there Johan has to go because of the Abyss. So that's very unfortunate. And okay, there we see he can now remove, at least he can remove the graveyard. And we also see a nice altered soul ring there. And he's going to draw even more cards. Wow, so much card advantage in this game for Nick. It's just unbelievable. And he's got all the Moxin in play, I believe, right now. And he's going to attack for two. So he's going to drop to 12 and just going to pass. I mean, if you've got complete control, you don't really need to kill your opponent quick because you have to control. And obviously, one of the best strategies when you're playing the deck is just playing really aggressive. Whoa, look at this! <laughs> Nico Bolas in the house! I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. Of course, there is, there is an answer because that's what his deck does. But it's just great, Edo, to see you cast these absolute beautiful creatures in this game. And I mean, the game is going actually as I expected. But, you know, you always kind of hope for the underdog. Uh, to get it, there's a Soul Canard, the Swamp King in hand, which is actually pretty cool because it's black, right? So you don't have to sack it to the Abyss. So that's pretty nice. It's a 5-5 five, five Swamp Walker. Are we going to see a Counterspell? I mean, he's used up a lot of his creature removal. So there's Library of Alexandria. There's another. I mean, so many cards here. He's got nine. He's got ten cards in hand right now. It's absolutely sick. Oh, and of course, then he finds the Mana Drain and he drains the Soul Canar away. Oh, man. There he attacks for three. He's going to go to ten. He's going to discard. Of course, two books already has two in play. I mean, his deck is going on full cylinders. And ever since that uh, Mind Twist resolved, Edo has just been kind of top decking. And he's been doing really well for the circumstances. But there's just no holding back here. The deck is working on all cylinders. There's the Bazaar of Baghdad. 
I mean, he could draw two, but then he has to discard his entire hand, so that's not really an option anymore for him now. There's really no way out, at least for this first game. And that's it. He's dead. And uh, I mean, Edo, man, I applaud. But Nick, what a good demonstration of what your deck wants to do. And you had just had complete control and card advantage almost the... I almost I think the entire game anyway both players are going to sideboard and I wonder if Edo is now going to sideboard in his stasis time vault plan I'm hoping so and we're going to see it in game number two so um yeah we'll let these players sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game number two game number two so the deck player Nick is only one game away from making it to the finals here at the Urborg Forest Frenzy and uh, Edo will have to try his absolute best to get is to get this into a 1-1. I mean, he's probably used his transformational cyborg tundra exactly. There's the black vice. Remember, he's playing time vault states his vice in his sideboard so he can all board that in and just basically have a completely different deck. So maybe this can kind of put some pressure on on the, on Nick. Unfortunately, Nick also took a mulligan, so he's only taking two damage for this vice going to 18 and I mean, he's playing exactly. There we see cards like Lotus. He's playing with all the mocks. And so it's not going to be really difficult for him to empty his hand quickly. There we see a Time Vault. We don't see a counter spell here. He's taking one damage from the Vice. Going to 17. I'm expecting... Interesting. He's giving him an extra turn. And now I'm expecting a Disenchant. Oh, Disenchant. Interesting. Disenchant on the Vice. This is interesting. He doesn't really seem to mind the, the Time Vault that much. I would kind of get, but that's why I'm not in the semi-final, but I would kind of get nervous, like seeing a time vault. I'm like, I'm going to disenchant the time vault, but he's not doing it. And a really nice strategy, by the way, of Edo, just saying, you know what, you just take this extra turn, whatever. And uh, it looks like Edo is not casting anything, just passing turn, no land. So that's very unfortunate for him. There we see a demonic tutor. Are we going to see a counter spell? No, we're not. So Edo is just going to say, you, you go ahead and... You look up whatever it is you need to look up. And unfortunately for Edo here, he missed that land drop. He's also pretty light on cards in hand. So I guess he also took a mulligan there. And um, now he's passing turn. Hopefully he can find something. And I think he has to pass here again. And he's thinking, am I going to do something on end step? He's going to play Ancestral Recall, going to draw into three more, going to untap. And this is looking very bad for Edo here because, again, we see kind of Nick running away with this game. He's going to deal two here. He's going to put on 18 and he's going to go in second May. No, he's going to pass. Edo's finding a land. Does he have maybe a draw seven or something? He's going to cast Recall. Are we going to see, oh, Red Elemental Blast coming in from the sideboard, countering that recall, unfortunately. There's a Mox Ruby dealing two more damage, 16 for Edo. And this is going to be tough. Looking at his hand again. A little bit in the tank here, of course. This is a deciding game. If he loses this, Nick will advance to the finals. An attack here. There we see a Swords. On the factory, two more life here. Nick gonna go to 16. But more importantly for Edo, the threat is gone. And we know that Nick doesn't have a lot of threats in his deck. I wonder if he boarded into Sarah Angels. I don't think so. There is a Soul Ring and Pass turn. And Nick passing here now as well. It's kind of like a standstill moment. At least Edo is now finding enough lands and mana sources to go do stuff. Playing another Time Vault and passing turn. There we see a Divine Offering on the tap Time Vault. So he's going to take some life. Time Vault's gone. And he's going to pass turn now. Okay, Torment Script. There is another Felber Stone. What's so difficult right now? I'm not sure how many cards Nick's got in hand. Three perhaps or something? I believe three or four. A little bit more perhaps. It's, it's just really hard now because... I mean, Nick's got so much mana, so he always has that counter option open. So it's really difficult for Edo to time. When do you want to do something? I guess the only good thing for Edo here is that Nick doesn't have any card draw engine yet. He hasn't drawn into his Jam Day Tomes. Because once he's got those Tomes, it's going to go really, really quickly. 
There we see a library of Alexander is looking at his hand. He's probably just going to do nothing waiting for that Loa to be activated. It's kind of hard to see his hand size. Maybe it's already activated. We'll see it in a moment if Nick is going to tap his uh, library of Alexandria. There we see a Chaos Orb. Yeah, so he's got seven hand. Now it's going to go to eight. Is he going to counter the orb? I mean, you know, Edo can flip on the Loa, I guess. And now he's going to activate in response. Yeah, disenchant. Yeah, that's, I mean, again, you know, like I said in game one, that's the problem with the deck. It's got so many answers. Oh, man. And there he's cracking the Lotus. So he's kind of going for it, it seems. No, he's not. He's changing his mind. I wonder what he what he wants to play with it. Cracks the Lotus into a, a Wheel of Fortune. And there, uh, unfortunately, a Counterspell. I always love, like, draw seven and stuff. But, yeah. And he's taking an extra turn. So he's hoping maybe to do something else here. Going to play a Stasis. That is actually pretty cool. Can Nick counter the Stasis? And, oh, Red Elemental Blast. That is unfortunate. I kind of saw a momentum for Edo. I really liked, again, the way he was playing. Playing first the Wheel of Fortune. Waiting for Nick to counter. Baiting the counter out. Then taking that extra turn untapping everything and then trying to cast the stasis but unfortunately there was the answer there's the ancestral recall does he have even more counter magic no he does not he lets it resolve can he now find okay there's a strip on the loa can he find another stasis here there's a vice still no counter spell there is the stasis oh can he resolve the stasis oh disenchant on stasis Ah, oh, at least he takes some damage from the vice, but man, that's unfortunate. It's not, I'm not surprised, but you kind of hope for, you know, for Edo to be lucky. Ooh, this is bad. Dust to dust card from the dark coming in from the sideboard. Absolute killer because it's a two for one. Taking care of two top artifacts on the side of Edo removes them from the game, by the way. Oh, it's such a good card. Oh, man. There we see a City of Brass. You know, Dust to Dust, the thing is, you need two white and one, so you need a double white to cast it. But if, if you're pretty heavy on white in your deck, I can really recommend you to at least play one main. There are so many artifacts in decks, usually in old school. There we see the Gem Day Tone by Nick, and there we see a Time Walk. And it's kind of like, I can now already see like Nick winning this game. He's got the control. And, and now it's just up to Edo to just kind of wait and hope for a miracle, you know, hope for kind of an opening where maybe he can play, I don't know, a time twister, you know, and kind of get back into the game. We saw him try it quite, well, not successfully because the, 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 the stasis couldn't stick, but he really tried and he was able to at least get a few of them on the board, but then there was always a disenchant or another way to deal with it from the side of, uh, of Nick, who's now attacking for six. So the Sarah Angel did come in from the sideboard and now we see Edo drop to 10. Let's see what he can do. So he's, he's basically on a two-turn clock now, casting another underground seat passing turn. We see JMD Tome activations. I mean, this is looking this is looking bad. It's going to go to two. And that's it. Ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful creatures, man. But I have to say, Nick, you've won this fair and square. You had complete control both of the games. That means we're going to see Nick next week, Tuesday, in the finals of the Urborg Forest Frenzy. So, I mean, if you want to see that, if you want to keep up to date with the channel, one of the things that you can do is um, you can actually... Uh, you can actually click the bell. That's what I'm trying to say. There's a little notification bell. If you click that bell, you'll get updates whenever I put a new video on. So if you want to stay on top of everything, click that bell. Talking about clicking, you can also really help the channel by leaving a like, leaving a comment, man. Uh, let me know what you think of the content I make. Let me know what you think of the deck and of, of course, the reanimator deck of Edo. Would love to hear from you. And if you have any questions, don't be shy. Feel free to ask them in the comment section as well and if you're completely new to the channel welcome to timmy talks nice to have you here don't forget to subscribe on your way out and there's one more thing that you can do you can also sponsor the channel financially so helping me keep giving you content and keep creating new old school magic content for you and you can already support the channel starting with a dollar how can you do that it's quite simple you can join the patreon program there's probably a link popping up right now if you click on the info card 
Um, it will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can become a patron of the channel. The cool thing is we've got our own Discord. I also organized some online uh, uh, tournaments to just thank the patrons and channel members for their support. So you can join those as well. And last but not least, your name will be uh, in the end scroll after every video. Talking about the end scroll, let's take a look at the amazing, the wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Ik het als ik het als somba kan zien.